Hello, this is Dr. Gerald Dirks, formerly the Reverend Gerald Dirks. In just a few moments, here on The Dean Show, we'll be talking about my conversion to Islam. Please, don't go away. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. How are you, brother? Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come and visit us here at The Dean Show. It's my pleasure, brother. Uh, you were actually a former minister, a deacon? Ordained deacon in the United Methodist Church. And you have a master's degree in divinity from Harvard University. From Harvard Divinity School, correct. Wow, this is, uh, and, and the list goes on. You uh, were a uh, preacher uh, at many, starting at a young age, you worked as a youth minister, ordained minister, and the list goes on. You've, we have some books also here that you that you've authored, you, you're obviously uh, very busy writing books, you, you, you uh, uh, are out there uh, trying to now uh, uh, mend the bridges, uh, build the bridges to help develop a better understanding be between Islam, uh, the Muslims, and people of other faiths. Yes. But we want to hear about your story. We want to know why would someone who was so high up in the ranks, who had so much knowledge of Christianity, you know the Bible well, what happened? Let's talk from your, we'll get a little bit of a history from a young age. Talk to us. Tell us how you uh, got involved in, in Christianity and your parents and etc. Sure. I grew up in a small rural community in Kansas where the church was the center of community life. Uh, it was a small town of about 500 people. We had three churches. Uh, every summer there were uh, ice cream socials at the churches, chicken pot pie dinners, mm -hmm. corn roasts, etc. Mm -hmm. And the churches really were the center of community life. And that was true for my family as well. Mm -hmm. We attended the local Methodist church. And uh, throughout my childhood, uh, I was very actively involved in collecting my perfect attendance pens from Sunday school, mm -hmm. my awards for memorizing biblical verses, etc. And so by the time I reached junior high school, uh, I was already considering the ministry as a personal calling. And about that time, uh, during the annual Youth Sunday, uh, I was always selected to deliver the sermon. And word of that got around, and before long I was preaching at various other local churches upon occasion, at nursing homes, at various church-affiliated organizations, etc. How old was this at? Uh, I was probably uh, about uh, 14 wow, when this started. Very, very young age. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I continued in that direction, and at age 17 I entered Harvard College as an undergraduate. Uh, with a philosophy uh, major, which was gearing towards seminary, mm -hmm. and uh, continued on in that direction. In 1972, I was ordained a deacon in the United Methodist Church, and in 1974, uh, I graduated with a Master of Divinity from uh, uh, Harvard Divinity School. Mm -hmm. Spent that summer as an interim minister in two rural parishes in Kansas. But in the fall of 1974, I left the ministry, mm -hmm. or at least left the parish ministry. I was still an ordained minister, but uh, never again would I uh, fill a pulpit after the fall of 1974, which probably brings us to the second part of the story if you want to move in that direction. Yeah, t tell us, what were you going to that? Why did you end up, I mean, you were filling the pulpits. I mean, did you have like a big crowd people would be excited to come listen to you preach and did you guys have a band how did that work to so describe this <laughs> this atmosphere oh uh, well at, at the risk of sounding immodest yeah uh, typically everywhere I, I preached we set attendance records you were like a Jimmy Swagger at the time of your community maybe a Joe Olstein of, of the, the small little town or well, I, I, I don't want to <laughs> do, do comparisons but yeah uh, suffice it to say uh, attendance typically skyrocketed. Oh, uh, nice! When when uh, I was behind the pulpit, so people knew who you were. Yes, they wanted you. They wanted a ticket to get into this uh, uh, church to see and to hear what you had to say because you had knowledge. You were a man of knowledge. So talk to us now from filling the pulpits, people lined up wanting to hear what you had to say from preaching the Bible. What now led you to leave the pulpit? Basically, it's one of the ironies of life that the churches often take the 
uh, most promising of their young ministers, and they send them to really good seminaries. And in those really good seminaries, such as the one I was fortunate enough to attend, you are systematically exposed to the oldest existing texts of how the Bible actually once read. You're exposed to the changes that were made in those texts, when those changes took place, why those changes took place, where those changes took place. Um, so once you receive that knowledge, and those changes, by the way, raise serious, serious questions mm -hmm. about such fundamental Christian doctrines as the Trinity, the sonship of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, uh, the crucifixion event, and uh, the doctrine of atonement in the blood. All of these come into serious question when you look at the oldest manuscripts that we have of what the Bible once said. So that was one consideration. The other consideration is that you are also given a very good grounding in the history of the early church. Now this is seminary school. Yes. Is this at, when, it, when, when does now seminary school come? Is that that's after Harvard now? Well, first you do the undergraduate. I did okay. four years undergraduate at Harvard. Okay. Received my BA. Yes. And then entered Harvard Divinity School, which is a seminary. Yes. And that's a three-year course of studies leading to a Master of Divinity. Okay, gotcha. So the, the second thing you're exposed to is the actual history of the early Christian church. And in terms of that, you're, you're exposed to the decidedly geopolitical machinations that really went into defining some of the fundamental doctrines and dogmas of Christianity. And, and notice I said geopolitical machinations, not theological considerations, mm -hmm. not religious considerations, but political considerations that went in. You're also exposed to the tremendous breadth of knowledge, the tremendous breadth of opinion that existed within early Christianity. You know, it was not monolithic. This is, is this like, kind of like the Christian fic? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> suffice it to say there were many different branches yeah. to early Christianity. Mm -hmm. Now, the branch that survived basically into modern times was Pauline Christianity. Mm -hmm. Uh, this was the Christianity that developed out of the teachings of Paul or, or Saul of Tarsus. This is what's mainstream today? Yes, basically, okay. yeah. But there were many other branches to early Christianity, mm -hmm. some of which survived for centuries mm -hmm. before they eventually died out. And one of the fundamental distinctions that uh, we can make is between Pauline Christianity, which was the Christianity that Paul took to the Gentiles and the non-Jews, principally in Europe, but also to a certain extent in Asia Minor. And we can contrast that with what's called the Jerusalem Church. Now, this was the actual disciples of Jesus. Yes. And how they practiced and what they believed. And there were decided differences between these two groups. But over time, because of geopolitical considerations, the different branches of Christianity were sort of systematically eliminated one by one. And when that was done, uh, unfortunately, that was done often at the expense of destroying uh, books that were once considered scripture by some of these branches of Christianity. So a lot of knowledge was lost in the destruction of these books. But these are the, the two fundamental reasons uh, why I left the Christian ministry. It really boiled down to an issue of personal integrity. Mm -hmm. You know, how can I stand behind the pulpit on Sunday morning and preach a sermon that I knew was at variance with the actual taproot of Christianity? Of course, if I stood behind the pulpit on Sunday morning and preached what I had been taught in seminary, I'd be looking for a new job within a week. Yeah. So this conflict existed. And as a result, uh, to preserve my personal uh, integrity, I left the active ministry and, and pursued graduate school in clinical psychology. And by the way, approximately half of my graduating class from Harvard Divinity School walked away from the parish ministry upon graduation. So I wasn't the only one. Is this kind of like the, have you heard of Bart Aram? 
yes, yes, kind course. of people also who have gotten engrossed and really started to go deeper into studying the original text, and many of them, they come to the conclusion that you have that... I mean, all you have to do is pick up a good Bible commentary, yeah. such as the Interpreter's Bible Commentary, and begin reading it. Yeah. And you'll be exposed in the process to, wait a minute, this text originally read this way, and this was inserted into the text around the year 380 in Spain. This sort of information's there. It's available to the public, but they have to really go out and study in order to find it. That's the thing. How many actually want to take the time to investigate instead of just blindly going along with what everyone else is going along yeah, with? Yeah, and it does take a great deal of time yeah. to try and do it on your own. Uh -huh.